It's 11 a.m. Tuesday, May 19th, 2020. This is CFO Online Houston, the predictions panel. Corporate finance department executives sharing live right now and in real time their current situations and some management relevant predictions. Uh, this is a qualified access only meeting among executive peers in finance management in Houston and the environs. Our predictions panel discussion will be just like the conversations you've seen on stage at CXO Sync CFO Houston live events. I'm Scott Schuster, your moderator. Once again, this time, click the arrow at the far right. You'll see four tabs. One of them is the questions tab, where we hope you'll submit a lot of questions for our panelists. The panelists and I will all be turning our attention to your questions later. Also, after you hear our panelists' predictions, you'll be able to vote on them under polls. The panelist whose prediction gets the most votes wins a prize. There's also a chat room where you can text chat with other participants during the program. Chat room will stay open for a while after the end of the program, so your conversations can continue. Our program is made possible today by Automation Anywhere, the 2,300 employee, 17-year-old developer of robotic process automation software, 1.7 million bots employed, the leader in RPA, named the leader by Gartner in Gartner's first assessment of uh, RPA last year. And uh, lots of other analysts' recognitions for things like how Automation Anywhere RPA combines with analytics, combines with AI, uh, and more. Be sure to say hello to Automation Anywhere's Jacqueline Crowley and Jillian Hertel in the chat area. Okay, without further ado, let me welcome our panelists. Eric Davis, Vice President for Finance and a 23-year veteran of the great Waste Management Corporation, one of Fortune Magazine's world's most admired companies, CR's 100 best corporate citizens, great place to work. I guess that's why Eric has stayed 23 years. He's been the head of yep. corporate finance, FP&A, uh, a lot of things. Vice President, Finance of Waste Management, Eric Davis. Welcome, Eric. Thank Omar you, Roots is the Vice President for Finance Process Automation at Schneider Electric, the giant a uh, $27 billion European multinational providing uh, digital solutions. 14 years with Snyder Electric for Omar, and uh, he's been the uh, uh, original uh, CFO for Denmark, for Algeria, and uh, also for all of Latin America before becoming president for process automation at Schneider Electric. Welcome, Omar you, Akru. Sir. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, let's start our uh, conversation with your predictions. And uh, uh, Eric, I'm actually going to ask you to go first. What would you like to predict? So I think, uh, you know, it, it's some of the recent economic data is pointing to obviously declines in the retail, in the retail sector as well as consumer spending. So I do think that people over the next 18 to three, 18 months to three years are gonna be trading out service for safety and they're gonna move some of that discretionary income into things like at home hobbies and staying local vacations and moving away from restaurants, bars, those types of things where they can practice the social distancing. And I think that's gonna be a, a big impact, positive impact on things like online shopping, video, uh, conferencing, upgrades to homes and home offices, that type of thing. Pretty negative impact on restaurants, except for things like fast food. I think fast food and Grubhub, Uber Eats, that type of thing really benefit in this uh, market. And I do think that'll continue longer than uh, what's expected as the demand side continues to stay away from uh, the crowded venues. Right, right. Uh, I wonder, do we know what, I mean, the, the country is split on this issue of the lockdown. Mm -hmm. so one can presume, I suppose, that uh, there is there is uh, one segment of the country that's eager to get back to their uh, uh, crowded outdoor concerts and get back into the movie theaters. And then there's others who are more cautious, who uh, are, you know, of the frame of mind that you mm -hmm. have just described. 
Do mm -hmm. we know the percentages on that? I don't know the percentages, but it's clear that you know. companies are actually taking a view on this and protecting themselves. You've seen a, a number of companies that are approaching this with different right. policies and so on. So it's, I, I think it continues for some time. Right. Yeah. And regardless of what the percentages are, yeah, mm -hmm. there will be that cadre of the population. It's kind of a new market. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah. So this is something you need to be prepared for. I'm glad you uh, raised the point, Eric. Thank you very much. Omar, what would you like to predict? Yeah, actually, I mean, considering the uh, the current situation, you know, uh, we need to, to note that there are, uh, it's an unprecedented crisis, right? And it's not only one crisis, it's uh, mm -hmm. three or up to four crises, meaning that we have, we are facing, of course, first of First of all, the uh, oil price depression, which started even before the uh, health crisis. Then we have, of course, the health crisis, and which, uh, of course, leading to financial crisis. And eventually, later on, and uh, many many people are predicting that it will be potentially a social uh, crisis because of uh, the increase of the uh, unemployment. So it's it's hard. I mean, to, to predict um, uh, what what we are doing, and and uh, Eric mentioned is that, that we need to focus on what we can control, right? So. Uh, that's what we are trying to do, uh, all of us. However, if you personally ask me, you know, uh, how do we see and you know, the economists have been predicted, predicting um, several models we heard before the crisis about the V-shape, some now is talking about U-shape and, and, and different models. However, what I can tell is that uh, I, I don't think that um, the business level will come back to, uh, to the same as it used to be before the crisis. That's my, uh, my view on it. For, uh, and the reason for that is, of course, uh, people and uh, investors will be cautious, you know, after exiting the, the crisis, watching out what's going on. Uh, second is, of course, the consumption will also, uh, will also decrease because uh, of the employment, but also because uh, some consumer will be also very cautious. And last but not least, we need to note that the uh, oil price depression did not end, right? And this, uh, because of the level of the production, this will continue uh, in 2020, uh, which means that, uh, of course, uh, for all the business that are, uh, especially in Houston, that are linked to that uh, sector, will right. continue to, to see the impact of the, this crisis uh, now and uh, in the future. Yeah. Uh, my prediction is that we won't come back to the level of the business before the crisis, not before 2020. Uh, some people, of course, 2020, predict that, uh, 2021, you mean? 2022, sorry. 2022, oh, 2022. okay. Mm -hmm. 2022. Mm -hmm. um, of course, some people are predicting that the rebound will start in Q3, some other in Q4, and some other maybe in 2021. As I, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's very hard. And I, I guess also, as uh, mentioned by Eric, but I think it depends mainly from what segment you'll be, right? Uh, whether B2C, B2B, and which, you know, if you think about the airline uh, sector, I mean, I'm not sure that they, or, or the hospitality sector, uh, which are currently the most impacted, it will take them to, sometimes to get out of the crisis. Some other, like, uh, you know, the Amazon or uh, the Facebook, are so far less impacted, right? So it depends really on which sector you are and how uh, also you are linked to the oil and gas uh, sector. Yeah, yeah. But uh, w one one topic that I would like really um, to mention is about, uh, and, and you've seen it with our customer, is uh, about digitalization. So really what uh, through this crisis and the fact that uh, many people and many companies are working, uh, are doing a home base, uh, working, so I think people uh, experience the uh, this trend and uh, how powerful is it to work uh, remotely, mm -hmm. and of course uh, many companies are accelerating their digital journey. Uh, we see it more and more. Uh, so some people were not, some company were not that convinced prior to the crisis, but I think now they are more convinced. However, with, this is also leading to uh, to uh, an increased threat about cybersecurity. Uh, currently, in my company, we see lots of requests from customers about, uh, you know, uh, this uh, topic. Mm -hmm. When you say customers, you mean um, you mean your employees or or the customers of of Schneider concerned about Cyber Electric? Uh, with you, you as the vendor to them, is that it? Yes, correct. Right. You, we we have an, uh, a big offer in cybersecurity mm -hmm. uh, together with our uh, solution. So, uh, oh, and yeah. of course, we see more and more uh, emphasis on that uh, topic. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, interesting, interesting. 
Um, and, and oh, please, I would say ahead. it's even more an acceleration because this topic, of course, started, you know, a couple of years ago. But really now we see an acceleration because, of course, if, if you need to uh, go more digital, then uh, this will be a, even a higher threat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the idea of the V-shaped or the U-shaped recovery. I saw in Bloomberg over the weekend, they're talking about something that's more L-shaped. It just goes on and on. And I'm I, I don't want to be pessimistic. So I did not even mention that one. All right. I, I mean, I don't want to be pessimistic either. But then you went ahead and you predicted no recovery until 2022. I think that's the L-shaped recovery uh, right there. Correct. I, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But yeah, it's so hard to predict. I'd, I'd hate to be a stock picker or or anything like that. And of course, you know, Houston, oh my gosh. I mean, it's practically a question of which is worse, you know, COVID-19 or the oil uh, depression. And now we hear we're expecting a really active hurricane season. This is, none of this is anything to smile about, but it's just unbelievable that this, that this, double and maybe triple whammy uh, approaches Houston. It's, it's just an astounding uh, situation. I'd like to ask you both about um, your preparation for what has happened with the pandemic. Did you invest in uh, big business continuity solutions so you could just flip a switch and all of your employees have uh, laptops at home and uh, everything just goes on so easily business continuity or disaster recovery, you might have called it by either name. I'd like to know, um, you know, how you've coped and uh, were there preparations that paid off? Eric, would you uh, be kind enough? Sure. So I can tell you from a waste management perspective, we took a very uh, early on a very hard look at the employee safety as well as mm -hmm. our customer and benefiting our customers. So on the employee side, we started off with uh, the PPE that our frontline employees in contacting or working with our, uh, our customers. We also put in a, a plan for financial continuity for those employees. So they didn't have to worry about paying the bills and they could focus on servicing our customers. Mm -hmm. As far as working from home, we did send 20,000 people home in about a week, uh, buying a lot of them laptops because a lot of them worked on desktops, jobs that were never intended to work from home, such as customer call centers and dispatch centers and that type of thing. So it was a, a bit of a Herculean effort that we did in the first week, week and a half, um, but it worked out very well. And I think Omar is correct. I think people have taken now a look at digitization and people working from home and they're reevaluating their long-term plans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Omar. Yeah. So, um, same what Eric mentioned. So uh, I think uh, in our case, we had uh, three main focus. First of all is, of course, the health and safety of our uh, employees uh, and our customer and our partner. Uh, so basically we are, um, you know, in, in some part of the business we do or project and services, that means that, you know, you uh, for business continuity, you need to have some people going to a uh, customer side. So uh, first, first thing we, wa we want to make sure that uh, really those people uh, that are still interacting with our customer and partner um, are, are, are health and safe. So basically, first of all, I mean, uh, uh, our main uh, focus was really to make sure that we have all the uh, uh, health and safety measure in terms of equipment, but also, also in terms of processes to make sure that uh, those people are first healthy and safe. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, uh, they, they, they uh, follow certain uh, uh, certain processes when when they go to a customer site because not to expose also our uh, our customer because business continuity for our customer was really one of the, the key topics especially you know we work on uh, on very strategical um, uh, segment like hospital mm -hmm. and data center these days which of course they uh, they need more than ever our support during this uh, uh, particular time and and, and really uh, of course Schneider was uh, in most of the country considered as a critical uh, business because of course we are uh, a supplier to all this uh, critical uh, uh, segment um, second is of course um, 
uh, is of course you know what uh, what uh, Eric mentioned about you know home office. So we really make sure you know on all our uh, because we have a data center uh, around the globe in the, for accounting, for HR, for uh, for customer care uh, services, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we, we make sure that you know uh, around the globe those people can work from home. Uh, and last but not least is our plan, right? I mean to be able to serve our customer, we need to make sure that our uh, plan continue to run. Uh, which is not easy because, you know, with the lockdown measure in many countries, uh, mm -hmm. it was, of course, uh, a battle uh, country by country, sometimes location by location, to make sure that those uh, plants uh, continue uh, to run as usual. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, with, the, with the measure of uh, social distancing, etc., which is pretty new for us, you know, so um, it, it was we need to adapt uh, to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're doing all of this uh, from home in your case? Were you at home? Yes, I, I am working uh, from home, um, mm -hmm. and uh, we. I adjusted. Frankly speaking, I was not used to work from home because uh, my office is only ten minutes from. Uh, oh. uh, you know, so it's oh. it's uh, it's very easy to go to the office. So uh, oh. I did not use to work from home, but uh, uh, surprisingly enough, I uh, I adjusted, and I think that's the, the case of all our uh, employees. So we get used to have, uh, of course. Uh, you know, virtual calls. Um, we have it anyhow, you know, I have a global role, so I, I used to have it with most of my team. Yeah. But uh, of course, the few people that I used to interact, so it become also virtual and uh, we get used to, the, to that very, very quickly. Yeah. And last but not least, I think, uh, as uh, mentioned by Eric, what we also had to adjust is really uh, having a tight, of, tight monitoring from financial uh, perspective to the situation. Uh, as we discussed in the beginning, you know, it's very hard to predict. So uh, basically, uh, because it's hard to predict, so you, you really need to build different scenario and, of course, activate the different measure and action depending on how uh, things evolve, right? And and the, the thing is, first, you need to build those scenarios, make sure that you are ready for the different uh, scenarios and make sure that you are really uh, agile and adaptable to uh, to the to the current situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like you're, you're making it happen in a very agile way at uh, Schneider. Thank you. Very much, Omar. Eric, how about you? Working from home? Yes, sure am working from home about two months now. So uh, yeah, it's going well though. We've adapted well. We mm -hmm. have to learn how to manage people a little bit differently, engaging with people much more intentionally and making sure you maintain those connections to your, to your organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how do you do that? It's it's very intentional. It's you you lose the uh, bumping in the hallway or in right. the kitchen getting coffee. You lose that connection, and so what you have to do is you have to be very purposeful in in making connections with people. So what I've been telling my folks is to call people by video rather than dropping them IM rather than dropping them email. Call them by video. Maintain that connection with them. We have to find a way to recreate that very casual interaction that you have in the office that really supports a lot of the work that we do because much of the messaging isn't done formally. It's done informally. Right. And so we're working We're working on that. It's, it's an adjustment. Mm -hmm. What do you think of virtual reality as a potential technology that would play a role in recreating that casual office environment that you just described? That's difficult. I think I'd have to see it come into play. I mean, we're having a challenging time getting people to use some of the video technologies that are right. now, exactly. right? So embracing what we have has been a little bit challenging because we've never been put in place to actually use it and never been challenged to really push it and, and see what we could do. So I, it could probably be done um, I'm not clear on exactly how it would work or what the advantages of that would right. be over the existing technologies. Yeah, yeah. It seems obvious that you know there is the there is the place where virtual reality could play a role in the corporate sphere. Mm -hmm. but whenever you mention it, what I'm what I'm noticing leading events like this, whenever you mention it, people are like, oh, not really. Oh no, no. <laughs> I, I mean, people aren't ready to think of that yet. But uh, I guarantee you, there's the VC funding somebody out there in the valley uh, who's working on this because uh, it does make sense uh, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, um, I'd like to ask you um, what else you're uh, really interested uh, in right now at, at waste management. Maybe uh, I don't know. It's hard to it's hard to leave aside uh, mm -hmm. uh, COVID nineteen. But um, what are you what are you what are you busy with right now at uh, waste management? 
Uh, well, we have a lot of big things going on, ERP and a number of other projects going on. Yeah. But COVID really is the center of our, our of what's happening right now. It's just we ch we continue to monitor what we can control, right? We, we can't control what the government's doing. We can't control the spread of the virus. And so the impacts of that were felt for our business, but we can't control the cost side and what we're doing on the cost side, how our business functions and how we do performance management. So one of the important things to remember about the waste business is that we were an essential service before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and we'll be an essential service after the pandemic, right? So our business is really woven into all aspects of the economy. So we don't have to worry so much about a liquidity, right? A liquidity issue. We don't have a liquidity problem. So we need to ensure that we can manage our costs appropriately with the revenue that's coming in. Additionally, we go back and look at our SGNA, big projects, that type of stuff. And where can we really call out costs that just aren't aren't needed? And we can try and keep those particular cost categories in line with the revenue that's coming in. So we're spending a lot of time on, on those areas. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, you mentioned to me before the program, you were investing in uh, robotic process automation just now. We are. We are. We have uh, an entire. We have an effort going on. Actually, automation anywhere is who we're using. Uh, oh, are you? Said, yeah, we sure are. And we uh, are setting up a a center of excellence in India right now. So we've we've got eight um, RPA bots in production. We are working on four or more for our ERP implementation, and we hope to have the uh, center of excellence set up in India by the end of the year. That's interesting. I want to come back to that in uh, in just a minute because um, Anurag Saxena of uh, of ISG, um, uh, Automation Anywhere partner, is going to join us in just a second. Um, uh, Omar, as VP Finance Process Automation, that's where your attention is uh, <laughs> all, all the time. Uh, tell me about what, what you're working on right now. Sorry, I was not able to hear the question because there was some uh, small noise, as I said. Yeah, somebody had a dot matrix printer going there. I don't know what that was all about. But um, yeah, as the head of uh, process, uh, financial process automation uh, at uh, Schneider Electric, uh, where are you putting your attention right now? You're probably way down the road on, on implementing robotic process automation, aren't you? Uh, we are, uh, but obviously, I mean, uh, frankly speaking, is not is not the focus uh, right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the focus is really how to go through this uh, very, uh, as I mentioned, exceptional crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, so, few things is of course uh, to monitor uh, tightly the uh, the situation from cost point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, we are not like uh, Eric mentioned, but of course we are exposed to cash. So cash is king and it's even more important these days. So we are really uh, doubling the effort on, um, on on cash collection and make sure that, uh, you know, invoicing uh, on time to our customer, because uh, we know that many of the customers, especially when you are exposed to oil and gas, mm -hmm. um, will be uh, an issue in the coming uh, weeks or month. So we need really to pay attention uh, to that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and beside that, as of course, you know, we uh, we continue, to, I mean, with the uh, with, with the lockdown coming uh, to, the, to an end for uh, many states and countries. Uh, so we, we are trying really to, uh, to figure out how uh, we manage the comeback of our uh, people to the uh, to the different offices, mm -hmm. which is sure. of course after managing the uh, the plant. Now it's it's the building, so uh, we are trying uh, uh, office by office to uh, to make that happen mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a safe uh, and healthy manner. Right, right. I'm glad you mentioned uh, the focus on cash. Make sure the collections are going on. Uh, make sure cash is being uh, is is at top of mind for everybody uh, in finance right now. Uh, somebody I was speaking with the other day, I don't recall if it was one of you, said that uh, uh, they thought that instead of seeing uh, growth and, uh, uh, well, the, the traditional measures that go into calculating a bonus, we're going to see uh, the development of a, a greater cash hoard as being uh, 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 um, uh, a function of financial executives who have the power to have influence there, and it will influence their bonus. Well, we'll see if that happens going forward. It's a prediction I heard at another another meeting. All right. Thank you both. And uh, speaking of RPA, as we did briefly there, I want to welcome to our program now Aranag Saxena, who's already on the screen, one of the wizards of uh, RPA for uh, finance and accounting. 
Anurag was uh, 20 years with Wipro and Tech Mahindra, uh, helping companies uh, implement RPA, among other technologies, uh, for process improvement. And all the while, he's been watching the maturation uh, of this technology for finance. Now he's a partner at the NASDAQ traded ISG Information Services Group, whose biggest growth area right now uh, is RPA. Anurag, thank you for joining us. Anurag, is the surge in um, remote work that we're, uh, uh, that we're seeing right now, is that propelling sitters toward implementing RPA? Or, um, or, or would RPA be growing at the same rate regardless of whether we had COVID-19 right now or not? Before I answer that question, first of all, thank you for having me here, Scott. Oh, pleasure. It's a pleasure. Uh, uh, you uh, there. But let me start with a fun fact, right? I mean, you've been talking about the L curve. You've been talking about the triple whammy. I, I wanted to start off this with a fun fact. Okay, the fun fact here is, uh, you know, the AI and the cognitive space uh, as it stands today uh -huh. uh, is a $9 trillion market space. Uh, mm -hmm. $9 trillion, uh, with a T. Uh, now, just to give you all a sense of the magnitude of that scale, uh, if you remember in the early 2000s, the digital music market that got disrupted by the Apple iPod, that market was a $45 billion market, right, only. Mm -hmm. uh, the digital media market disrupted by Netflix, Google, Amazon uh, is a half a trillion dollar market. Mm -hmm. So to state that automation is a $9 trillion market, uh, which is almost like one third of the GDP of the world. Uh, it just calls for whether AI and automation, is it a myth or is it a reality, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so to answer your question, coming back to your question, I believe RPA here uh, has been in existence uh, since you know, uh, the the, the uh, computer technologies existed, right? That's I mean, right. we started mm -hmm. off with automating scripts. We started off with automating anything that we used to find mundane or repetitive. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and it has just evolved. It has taken a new avatar as we have, uh, you know, moved through the software methodology and, and, and the code maturity of software, right? So I think that's what we, where we are. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's here to stay. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no question. It's uh, it's booming. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, it's uh, it's something I'm hearing about on every one uh, of these uh, events that we're leading. Uh, I'm hearing about this investment just uh, just happening uh, everywhere. Are you uh, getting different requests now from the people who call you? How have the last couple of months changed uh, what you're hearing clients ask for? in finance process automation? Yeah, you know, again, yes, there have been uh, calls to us, you know, in a different uh, manner, right? What, are, what do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the clients are looking at speed. They're looking at agility. They're looking at adoption. They're looking at adaptability. Uh -huh. There are so many nuances now that are playing in the world today that, that dictate uh, how are we going to implement or introduce zero touch process for example mm -hmm. how are we going to introduce a zero touch system mm -hmm. how are these new enterprises and you were talking about high availability and disaster recovery can we relook at what those business process that dictate disaster recovery are we dusting off uh, those books that wrote the business uh, uh, you know re recovery 15 20 years back for our enterprises right so all of those are being embraced now. We are talking to the needs of what that new enterprise would look like. Working from home is now become the new normal, which means that do I need to do I need a digital assistant, right? Sitting on my desktop, prompting me to think out of the box. That's machine learning at its best, right? Mm -hmm. Where do I get that knowledge base, right? I don't have, I can't just turn around to my colleague and say, hey, what was the name of the prime minister of Britain in 1970, right? I have a digital assistant. I can always invoke it. We have Google. 
but then you know we need something that is learning at a consistent pace learning our business learning our vernacular learning the way our business runs and then applying it to to our business and that's what the new age is all coming about so those are some of the new calls we are getting now how do i get a digital assistant how do i get a zero touch process implemented and if i get that implemented how is it automated and so on and so forth mm -hmm. the roi is no more a 24 36 month roi it is now reducing to a 6 to 8 month roi the c suite is putting pressure on all of us mm -hmm. saying that i need an roi today in 6 months i cannot wait for 24 months right those days are gone mm -hmm. so all all of that yeah um so what you've described, that's much bigger than RPA. And uh, as I said, what I'm hearing lately is uh, RPA. This is, a, this is when we want to implement RPA. Haven't done RPA yet, haven't done much RPA, want to do more RPA. RPA still makes sense as a standalone, right? Doesn't it? Even if you don't want to go on and, and bring in all these other technologies at the same time. You, you want to bring the best out of a technology. Right. And when you, in doing so, trying to bring the best out of a technology, you would need a, a, a lot of supplementary and complementary technologies that surround that technology. So RPA absolutely can work in its silo. But, you know, if you want to bring the best out in an enterprise, you would need a cloud. You would need to adopt low code. You would need to adopt automation. Uh, I mean, sorry, uh, artificial intelligence, blockchain. You were talking about virtual reality. Right. How do I use 5G? Uh, and how do I use uh, virtual reality together to provide training to 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 the nurses and the healthcare workers, you know, remotely, and so on and so forth. So so much of that could be used, uh, right? And 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 so it it could be used in silos, but you know, best used when it is it's combined with the other technology or the evolving technologies that that we are seeing today. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask uh, Eric and Omar about that as you think about. Uh, uh, finance process uh, automation. Uh, what are the what are the main touch points that you're each shooting for? Not just RPA, or is it just RPA for you, Eric? You want to go first? Sure, I, I would tell you that RPA is one of a. So our RPA program is set up within a process improvement team, and that team focuses on individual processes and streamlining those processes. And RPA is just one of a se several tools that they use in order to to improve those processes. Some of those other tools may be offshoring, it may be simple process improvement internally. So we have some black belts employed to focus on individual process improvement. And again, RPA is just one of a number of options. Mm -hmm. Omar? I mean, uh, more than ever, I mean, with the current situation, uh, it shows the need of this kind of, uh, you know, tools to help to predict, right? I mean, uh, the first thing, uh, you know, when uh, when the crisis started, my uh, my uh, CEO would come back to me and say, OK, can we can we make some simulation with, the, you know, our RPA tool to, to check, you know, what are the different scenarios? Uh, can we look to the historical data? You know, uh, we look back to the 2008, 2009 crisis. We look to the oil and gas uh, price depression of 2015, 2016. We, we look even further back, you know, about all the oil prices depression to check, you know, uh, how we can uh, use our current tool to help us to predict the future. Of course, as I mentioned, you know, even though this is a really a very exceptional crisis and it's uh, accumulating different crises at the same time, so it's, it's hard to predict, but of course, um, RPA tools or other uh, uh, other um, processes can definitely help us uh, to get to have the, the best prediction of the future, mm -hmm. even though it's hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm hoping uh, to hear that uh, we're not retarding our digital transformations too much during this period, and that uh, we're able to continue because, after all, we need that transformation more than ever. Now, Anurag, thanks for uh, contributing to our conversation here, and congratulations on the success of MISD. Uh, panelists, let's turn our attention during these next few minutes to the questions that have been submitted by our audience participants. So if you'll click on the questions tab, and we'll take a look at uh, what is being uh, asked there. I'll just start at the top of the list here. Freddy Salvatierra asks, what kind of relief measurements 
are you implementing or seeing in the markets to help your customers and suppliers navigate the crisis? Hmm. Uh, Eric, Omar, what are you, uh, are, are you hearing this kind of uh, request from, from the markets, customers? Yeah, I would tell you that it's one of the things that we considered when looking at our financial planning approach, because we've actually put in place some support options on just extending payments and how people come back online and how we charge people going through this, this pandemic. And so that was one of the considerations we had during our financial plan. So we are seeing it, we are employing some of those within, uh, within our organization. Mm -hmm. Omar? Uh, uh, as I mentioned, you really, I mean, uh, cash is king, right, in this kind uh, of situation. So we are really paying big attention to it. And of course, we received uh, several requests from uh, our customer. And we are really uh, monitoring the situation case by case. You know, we cannot, uh, uh, as you can imagine, if we extend all our payment terms to all our customer, we'll, we'll, we'll be ourselves in a difficult situation. So we're really doing it uh, on a case by case. and. Uh, monitoring uh, tightly the situation and, and the request and being, of course, uh, uh, as much, uh, you know, we try to accommodate as much as we can our customer, but also looking to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the risk that we are taking at every time. Mm -hmm. Anurag, you're in and out of a lot of uh, CFO's offices, and everybody's having to turn on a dime and change what they have underway. What are, what are you doing in this regard? Well, you know, we are looking at a lot of uh, uh, clients, right, across the verticals, across the industries, and one such industry that has really been calling out uh, in in this age and in this new new normal mm -hmm. is the contact center, uh, yeah. you know, agents, right, where they mm -hmm. receive calls. Uh, just give you an example, we were talking to uh, the Life Alert guys, right? I mean, you are receiving calls from Life Alert, which are ninety percent not an emergency call, uh, right? They are like calls that you know say. Can you change my password? I, I I've got this uh, computer I'm I'm working on. It's stuck. The screen froze. Can you help me out there? So, those are calls that you know you would w want to get deflected. How does technology? How does automation deflect those calls? Mm -hmm. How do you get ro robots or, or or automation, digital assistants as we call them, uh, to to deflect those calls? Respond to the calls, of course get them to a point where they're comfortable and then, you know, but not use humans uh, who are needed now to really look at maybe the COVID situation or an actual emergency that is happening at that point. So just some of these examples that you are now looking at, trying to tweak mm -hmm. the world uh, in, in, in a better way. All right. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Time grows short. I want to uh, call attention to the polls tab where, uh, you can vote on the predictions from our two panelists. We see quite a number of votes there already. Eric, it looks like you're going to be the winner. Uh, I think that's because, you know, folks in Houston are naturally optimistic. You've got to be. And uh, to hear that there's not going to be any recovery until 2022, oh my gosh, it's hard to vote for that as your favorite prediction, Omar. <laughs> so, uh, and, and it's hard to argue with Eric's prediction. So we see who the winner is there. Eric, congratulations. You're going to receive a $200 gift certificate to the uh, charity of your choice. Eric, congratulations. Uh, Great, thank you. That. And then there are, uh, there's another poll there from uh, Automation Anywhere, if you'd take a, a look at that. And um, also, uh, panelists, you're invited to visit the chat room and see what, uh, see what folks are saying uh, over there. And, uh, and there we have it. There we come to the end of uh, our session together. I'd like to thank you, uh, all three of you, Eric Davis, uh, Omar Akrut, and, uh, and um, uh, Mr. Saxena, Anurag Saxena, uh, for your participation here. Thanks all who are tuned in. I'm Scott Schuster, hoping to see you at the next CFO Online Houston. Thanks for joining us and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.